God's kingdom on earth is a really exciting topic and the Bible has heaps to say about it. So I want to spend most of the night looking at places in the Bible where God's kingdom is mentioned so we can build a picture in our minds of what it's going to look like. With all the craziness going on in the world at the moment, hope is something we desperately need. And there is so much hope to be found in the Bible. Now this hope we're talking about isn't a, I hope it's a sunny day tomorrow, or I hope the boss is gonna give me a pay rise. These kind of things are possibilities, but we're never sure of them. The word hope in the Bible, in reference to God's kingdom, is used as a firm, concrete thing. It's a thing to be trusted. The definition for hope in the dictionary is a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. But when we look at the Greek word for hope used in the New Testament, it means to expect or have confidence in. This hope spoken of is an assurance. It's going to happen. The hope of God's kingdom on earth is 100% a sure thing. It's a promise that's given over and over again in the Bible. And because of other prophecies that have come true, we can have absolute faith that this one will too. So having a vision of the kingdom or hope is a vital part of being a follower of Jesus. We read in Proverbs 29 verse 18 that where there is no vision, the people perish. And then in Hebrews 12, we read about our Lord Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Our Lord Jesus went through all that suffering by looking to the future, for the joy that was to come. So hope affects our life right now. It gives us clarity and vision, and it actually affects how we live and the choices we make now. And I know for me personally, the kingdom is a huge part of my faith. When thinking about my kingdom vision, it's changed quite a lot over the years. When I was young, it was all about living forever, riding wild animals, breathing underwater. And I still love those ideas, but things have gotten, as I've gotten older, my, it's changed, it's a lot more than that. It's freedom from sin. It's at one with my God and his son. It's a mind at peace. No more worry, no more tiredness or aches. Having time. Now we're all different, we're different ages, different upbringings, different surroundings, and we all go through different trials. And so our visions of the kingdom is going to look different for each of us. For someone who's living under fear of persecution, just for owning or reading a Bible, then the promise of a world where everyone knows about God and his ways, and quotes like every man living under his own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, might be their kingdom vision. Or maybe someone battling some incurable disease or sickness or old age, it's freedom from these mortal bodies to immortal bodies. But what we can take huge comfort from is that our creator, the one who made us, he knows us. He knows what makes us tick. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And there is a lot of chapters in the Bible that talk about this exciting time. So firstly, I just want to talk about where this kingdom is going to be. So the Bible talks a lot about the kingdom of God being on earth. The book of Daniel has a lot written about the lead up to this future kingdom. In Daniel chapter 2 verse 31, we read about this man, King Nebuchadnezzar, who has a dream describing a great image, and it really rattles him. He sees this great image with a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Then in verse 34, we read about a stone cut out of a mountain without hands, which smites the image at his feet and breaks it to pieces. Then in verse 35, all the broken pieces become like chaff and the wind carries them away. Then we read how the stone that hit the image becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. Now this all seems a bit strange until we get to verse 36 where we have the explanation to what this is all about. We read how each different metal represents kingdoms of men, starting with Great Babylon, of which Nebuchadnezzar was king of, right down to our current day now. 
Pretty incredible, really. And lots to talk about, but not tonight. Tonight I want to focus on verse 44, where we read, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The stone in this vision represents the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can take great comfort in this chapter because this is all about prophecy being fulfilled, meaning we can trust in the Bible and be assured of the kingdom coming and filling the whole earth. In Jesus' teachings, he often refers to the kingdom. And in Matthew 3, verse 23, we read, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel, or the good news of the kingdom. So Christ came to preach the good news about the kingdom, and in his teachings, he often referred to the kingdom as the kingdom of heaven. But does this mean a kingdom in heaven, or some other coming kingdom different to the one on earth? So the word kingdom means a dominion or an area ruled over by a king. And heaven is often referred to as God's dwelling place. In the Lord's Prayer, we read, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is where God's will is done or carried out. And eventually, as Jesus prayed, God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God's will or his purpose well, we read about that in Numbers 14, verse 21. As truly as I live, said God, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. And here again in these other quotes from Habakkuk and Isaiah, it's reiterated that it's the earth that will be changed. The earth definitely isn't a place that is full of glory to God right now, but it will be. And I find real comfort that the Creator didn't just create earth on a whim, but before he created earth, he had a purpose in mind. And better yet, he has invited us to share in his purpose by giving us this hope of living forever in his kingdom on earth. So with any kingdom, there's a king. So let's talk about this king. In 2 Samuel 7, we read about God's promise to David, how that from David's lineage, a king would come who in verse 14 would be the Son of God, and whose throne would be established forever. And in case we're not sure who this king is, if you go to Luke 1, which is up on the screen, and I'll just read from verse 30. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So this king is the son of David and the son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we just got a new manager at work recently, and it's always a bit, oh, what's he going to be like? Nice bloke or not? Is he going to have the same values as me? Is he going to be fair, lead by example? Those kind of questions. Well, let me tell you about this king. This king, he already knows us. He understands sin. He understands mortality. And right now, we have a whole Bible available to us to read and to learn about his character and how we can be like him. This man healed the sick. He cared for the poor and the needy. He had time for people. He had compassion. He had time for little children. We read he never had a place to rest his head. He understands power. Jesus had the power of God at his disposal, but he never used it, but he only ever used it for others. But he's not a pushover. He spoke the truth and he told people honest truths, not what they wanted to hear, but what they needed to hear. He led by example. He had complete control over his emotions. For example, leading up to his crucifixion, we read in Matthew 26, where Jesus says, Do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, 
and he shall give me more than 12 legions of angels. Now, legions had anywhere between 3,000 and 6,000 men. So we're talking a lot of angels there. And he lived his life completely for others. He is the best example for us in how to love God, to do God's will before our own. And this king gave his life for us. And when I think of our world leaders today, just imagine if these were their characteristics. Jesus as king is such an incredible concept and a complete game changer. But if this isn't enough, wait till we talk about the changes that are going to happen to the earth. So where is this... Where is King Jesus going to reign from? Where is his throne located? Excuse me. So Jerusalem is going to be the capital. And we read about this in Isaiah 2 verse 3, which says, And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that he may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And then in Psalm 48 verse 2, we read, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Now Mount Zion is the name used for the hill on which Jerusalem is built. So if you see that name come up when you're reading the Bible, that's what it means. Jerusalem was built on Mount Zion. So his throne or capital is in Jerusalem. But his rule extends over the whole earth, as we read about in Daniel with the stone, which turns into a mountain and fills the whole earth. Now the Bible has lots of detail about this new Jerusalem, the capital, what it's going to look like, with a huge temple set up, and we find this detail scattered throughout the Bible. It's referred to as the mountain of the Lord. And in that quote we just read in Isaiah, that the books of Ezekiel and Revelation have lots to say about it. It's going to be the centre of government and worship. The book of Ezekiel has the actual building plans in chapters 40 through to chapters 48, where he received it in a vision or prophecy all about the temple. And here on the screen is a bit of an artist's impression of what it's going to look like. And there is a lot of information in these chapters, which is helpful to build our vision in our minds. But what we can be sure of is that this future temple is going to be like nothing we've ever experienced before. And when Jesus returns to this earth to set up God's kingdom, those who have chosen to follow him in their lives and have made the choice to be baptised into Christ will by God's grace be given immortality. A lot of these people have since died, but will be resurrected, which is another awesome subject, but unfortunately we won't be looking at that tonight. Now, immortality is a huge part of God's kingdom and a really exciting concept. There's this quote in Ecclesiastes 3, and in verse 11 it reads, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. So God has set eternity in our hearts. God has put that desire there. We all want forever. Death always seems unfair. We see this in the children's stories with Happily Ever After, and it's a big part of the movies. But immortality in the Bible is very different to what we see in the movies. So I want to talk about what it is. Firstly, with immortality, it becomes a change from, from corruptible bodies to incorruptible bodies. We can no longer die, but more importantly, we can no longer sin. So to understand what immortality looks like, there are quotes which directly describe it, and we can also look to what the angels are like. Because we are told as part of the promises in Luke 20 verse 36, that in the kingdom we will be equal to the angels. So living forever is the obvious one, but this isn't the half of it. There are so many more things to think about. We'll have the ability to read minds, invisibility, able to strengthen people, inexhaustible energy, 
We'll be able to see the face of God. We'll have control over our emotions. Able to heal the sick and to raise the dead. We'll be powerful warriors who carry out God's desire. And this is by no means the full list, but it's just a few ideas to help us understand immortality. So I want to talk just for a little bit about the 1,000 year reign of Christ. I'm not sure if you've heard of it before. It might sound a bit confusing, but just bear with me. When Jesus returns to set up God's kingdom, there will be two main groups of people. There will be those who made the choice in their lives to recognise their creator and follow his ways and are given immortality. And there will be those who don't yet know about God and his purpose and will have the opportunity to learn and grow. These people will still be mortal. So when Jesus returns as king to this earth, there will be 1,000 years of restoring the earth and people being taught God's ways. And all the exciting changes to this world that we're going to be looking at tonight. Now this is shown in Revelation 20 verse 6, where we read, They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And then, at the end of the 1,000 years, there will be a final judgment of the mortals and the result will be a world full of only immortal people and Jesus, the King in Jerusalem, will hand the kingdom over to his Father. And we read about this in 1 Corinthians 15. For he, Christ, must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And when all things are subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him. That's God. That put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. So here we see the completion of God's plan with the earth, which we read back in Numbers 14 verse 21. As truly as I live, said God, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. And in Revelation 21, we have that well-known quote, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea, or mortals, was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. What an incredible time to look forward to. And this has been God's plan since the beginning. So coming back to the start of the 1,000 years, back to when Jesus returns to the earth. Now there are so many prophecies which give us a picture of what this will be like. And even though there are so many things that obviously need fixing in this world, with Jesus as king and many, many immortal saints and angels to help, the transformation of this earth will be incredible. Now, the book, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, which we read tonight, is a good place to start as it's filled with lots of word pictures that can really help take our minds to the future. So in Isaiah 35, we read about deserts blooming as roses. Imagine places like the Sahara Desert being transformed into beautiful, habitable places. Water and streams in the deserts. People being healed of blindness and deafness. People that can't walk leaping like deer. People that can't talk can now sing. We read about everlasting joy. And over in Micah, we read about this highway to Jerusalem, the capital of the king. Everyone wants to go there, to the mountain of the Lord. People want to be taught about God's ways. What a different time compared to now. 
This king will judge all the nations afar off. Strong nations, it says. And we read about swords and spears being turned into farm equipment. There's no need for weapons now. Nations will not fight against nation. Neither will they learn war anymore. A time of peace. World peace. This is such a foreign concept to us. With wars going on everywhere, talk of wars and all the money that's spent on war. And then there's this one I really like. This I've always had this thing about owning a few acres and living off the land. And here we read in verse 4, They shall sit, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. And then we've got Isaiah 65. We read in verse 17, The former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. I love this. This new life will be so awesome we won't want to look back. And we read in verse 22 of long life, like the days of a tree. And I've seen some trees that have been around for a very long time. We have animals living in harmony together. We read about lions eating straw like oxen. I think of those David Attenborough movies where we see the zebra running away from the lion and you're hoping he makes it. And then, you, then it moves on to the polar bear where he's, all his ice caps are melting and he can't find any food. And there's some walruses and you hope you can get one. Well, no more because things have changed. The meat eaters are going to eat straw like the grass eaters. Harmony even in the animal world. And then Isaiah 11, a king who judges with perfect balance. This king can read minds, who has wisdom, understanding, might and knowledge. We have that picture of a little child leading these animals. Kids able to play with poisonous snakes. Verse 9 says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's just such a beautiful picture. Everything is in balance. Fear, worry, even in the animal kingdom is sorted. People are living in harmony with creation and each other. And Psalm 72 is another great one to mull over if you have time. It describes the time of the kingdom and being under the amazing rule of Jesus. So different today. But I just want to focus on this verse, in six, this verse 16, which talks about, There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. Or another version says, Abundance of grain shall be throughout the land. And then there's this awesome verse in Amos 9 verse 13. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the ploughman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. Wow, wouldn't any farmer want this, eh? So they actually can't keep up with the food that's coming in. There's no more drought, bushfires, famine, mice plagues. Everything is just working in harmony. Now, I don't call myself a greenie, but I don't think anyone enjoys seeing the world in its current state. It doesn't look good. In fact, it's quite miserable. The oceans are filling up with plastic. Trees are getting cut down at a rapid rate. Pollution, animals going extinct. Man's greed is just unstoppable. And it makes me think of that Indian proverb, only when the last tree has died and the last river been poisoned and the last fish has been caught, will we realise we cannot eat money. So when is all this going to happen? Well, the disciples asked this same question to Jesus in Matthew 24. And Jesus replied that it is not for us to know the day or the hour. And he said, no man knows the day or the hour, not even the angels, except my Father in heaven. But we do know that God has a day. And I have thought before, what would it change if I did know the exact day the kingdom would come? And I think it's in God's wisdom and foreknowledge that we don't know. But we have the confident assurance that what God has said will happen. And all we need to do is to follow our Lord's example, 
to grow in our faith and our love of God and his Son and continue to share this good news of the kingdom and our Lord Jesus with everyone we meet. We live in a world where everything is here and now and the idea of waiting for anything never sits well with us. Now my wife forwarded me this message the other day after I was being a bit impatient over something. Um, in retrospect, I can see that wait is the most precious answer God can give us. It makes us cling to him rather than any outcome. And then in Lamentations we read, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seeketh him, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Well, tonight we've talked about God's future kingdom on earth, with Jesus, the Son of God, ruling as king, and the incredible changes that are going to happen. A righteous, fair king, immortality, nations no longer at war, but Jesus, king over all. God's law going out from Jerusalem, nations wanting to come up to Jerusalem to learn about God, people dwelling in safety, no fear, sickness healed, Streams in the deserts, animals no longer eating each other, children able to play with once dangerous animals. And there are so many more quotes we could have looked at tonight, but hopefully you've started to get a picture of how good this kingdom age is going to be and what an incredible hope the Bible has laid out for us. So what now? Well, growing up in a world where if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, has maybe turned us into sceptics. But this isn't a catch. In Luke 12, verse 32, we read Jesus telling us, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants us there. So if this kingdom, and living forever under the righteous rule of a loving creator and his son is what we want, then it's time to make the choice to answer the call to be part of God's family. Anyone and everyone can become part of this family when they make the choice to follow Jesus now and choose to be baptised and build a relationship with him and our Father in heaven.